welcome back to international conference on celebrating 100 years of the University of Dhaka, reflections from alumni, national and international. We would start the second session of the webinar, Arts, Literature and Culture, now. For this session, we have three distinguished speakers as well. We will start off with Professor Dr. Kaiser Hawk, Professor of English and Dean, Arts and Humanities, University of Liberal Arts, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Then we have Dr. Asfar Hussein, Integrative, Religious and Intercultural Studies, IRIS Department, Brooks College of Interdisciplinary <coughs> Studies, Grand Valley State, uh, Grand Valley State University, Allendale, Michigan, USA among us. And finally, we have Mr. Anis Ahmed, International Multimedia Broadcast Journalist, Voice of America, USA. This session will be moderated by erudite professor Syed Manzurul Islam, former professor, Department of English, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. Before handing over the floor, I would like to remind our speakers that each speaker is allotted 20 minutes of time. And if the time exceeds the limit, Zoom will put you in the waiting room. For the kind convenience of the speakers, three minutes gentle reminder will be given at the 17th minutes of into the presentation. Now I'm urging Professor Syed Munzur Islam Sar to take over and conduct the session, sir. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sadia. Uh, it's a very sort of um, comprehensive introduction. I don't need to do more after that. And um, I like the kind of warning you are flashing out after 17 minutes. <laughs> a gentle reminder to finish up everything in the next three minutes. And after 20 minutes, you'll be unceremoniously uh, uttered into a waiting room. I don't think anybody likes that. But well, I'm very happy. We are very safe. We have three very distinguished speakers today. All of them have done plenty of uh, seminar rounds internationally, and they have the experience to do that. Um, I have 10 minutes in all. Uh, I'd like to save some minutes for the Q&A. I'm sure the Q&A that will follow will be very exciting. Uh, plenty of questions to ask because we, have, we are rich in theory today and also examples of how Dhaka University has developed the culture of the entire nation. Let me remember in 1921, um, two universities were set up in the greater Bengal. One Dhaka University, the other uh, Vishwabharati University in Shantiniketan. If you, if you remember Ravindranath Thakur's essay on the Eastern University, um, which was the ideal university in his mind, he emphasized on the enlightenment project, so to say, developing reason, uh, developing the minds of the individuals with knowledge, dissemination of knowledge. So his was a university which was supposed to um, fulfill the obligations of all the universities in the world, starting with uh, the University of Bologna, um, to develop enlightened minds. Um, but if you look at the university today, it has fallen rather short of the ideals uh, Tagore imagined the university would be imbibed with. Dhaka University, on the other hand, was built on the kind of what is called Oxford model. For a time, it was called, still it is being called the Oxford of the East. Uh, we also remember another university set up in 1887, Allahabad University, and which uh, began to function under an act in 1921, once again the same year, uh, which uh, also was called Oxford of the East, which was also built on the Oxford model with residential facilities for students, where the deans and the provosts were supposed to contribute to the development of the enlightened individuals who would lead the nation intellectually. But uh, in the three phases of Dhaka University, we have seen it is doing that. It is no, no doubt it is the prime, prime uh, academic hub of, of Bangladesh, but it has also contributed to political uh, movements. You have shaped the political anti-colonial resistance movements, not only from 1921 to 1947, but even after that, when the neo-colonialists took over and uh, ruled until 1971. But we should not uh, think that after 1971, the colonial past was entirely forgotten. It remained in different structures and still continue to haunt us. 
and Dhaka University's role therefore remains in that particular um, uh, way the same. But in terms of culture, arts and literature, Dhaka University has substantial contributions. It has nurtured the uh, atmosphere in which uh, the three minds connected with each other, exchanged ideas, uh, encouraged creativity, and contributed to the building of a nation as well as a nation's literature, culture, music, painting, and everything. I don't think any other university in history of the world had done exactly the same thing as Dhaka University has done. Um, which university has led to the creation of a nation? Uh, not Allahabad University, not the universities which are set up well before Dhaka University in India. They had, of course, contributions, but people did not have the kind of same expectations about them. So with that in mind, um, the seminar series, and I thank Imtiaz, he has taken great pains in putting together themes and ideas and also scholars. Um, uh, the whole idea has been to explore how Dhaka University has contributed to the cultural ethos of the nation. And today we have three speakers, as I said, Professor Kaiser Huck, um, we, and uh, Professor Asfar Hussein and Anis Ahmed. All three are incidentally poets. Um, Kaisar is, of course, the most outstanding poet. Um, he's greatly admired. Um, he writes in English, and he has, he's being read all over the world. And so he is known in one name. He is a poet writing in English, but I don't think writing in English puts him in a separate class. He is a poet. Asfar is also a poet, uh, and Anis uh, is writing in Bangla. He doesn't write in English. Um, Kaisar has been interested in culture. I mean, that goes without saying. Um, he, one, of his, one of his last books has been a reworking of the Mansha Mongol Kabbo uh, in a spectacular form. Uh, it's called The Triumph of the Snake Goddess. Um, published from Harvard University. Anyone who has read that sees uh, the Monsha Mongol tradition coming alive in weaving an intricate tale with um, plenty of uh, uh, fun and um, comedy, but at the same time, it's a very serious work. It's a remaking of a tradition which is very old and contemporizing many of the ideas which circulated in, um, in olden times. He has written a large number of, uh, he has a, a substantial collection of books, poems, uh, which as I said, are being read. I teach his poems in post-colonial course in, Dhaka, in ULAP, where I teach now. Um, uh, Asfar is a theorist. Uh, he has um, contributed to an understanding of philosophy. Uh, he wrote in Banga, the latest book has been very popular, Darshanupak, Darshanak Khan. Uh, this is the book, the title of the book is. Um, he also writes on post-colonialism, and today his speech would be on the convergence of different kinds of post-colonialities centering around Dhaka University. So let me um, first welcome Professor, Professor Kaiser Hock to speak on Dhaka University and the formation of Bangladesh literary culture. I do not take, I am not taking a very long time in introducing the speakers because the brochure has exhaustive introductions to all three uh, speakers tonight. And I invite all the uh, listeners to please look up the brochures and see how they have been shaping the minds of the readers and the students they have taught uh, for a very long time. Anis has shifted to uh, multimedia journalism, but has not totally veered off from teaching whenever he finds the time he takes courses in linguistics, which is his area of expertise. So without much ado, Kaiser, the floor is yours once again. And uh, as Prama Sadia Prama reminded you, 20. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I mean, even if I can't finish, I'll be self-packing. That's fine. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, I'm no longer dean. I, uh, my term is over, so uh, I'm just, uh, I'm back to my original designation professor. And uh, I also was at Dhaka University um, for more than 40 years. Anyway, the, the subject of my talk, 
is uh, the Dhaka University and the group of uh, Bangladeshi literary culture. So the term literary culture, this is not very widely used, but it is now uh, you know, coming into use in certain uh, sophisticated circles, let's say. So instead of just talking about literature, we talk about literary culture. Literary culture implies more than the aggregate of literary works. Um, I will follow the definition given by uh, Shubhita Kobiraj in the two histories of literary culture in Bengal. In an anthology titled Literary Cultures in History, Reconstructions from South Asia, edited by Sheldon Pollock. Um, now, conventional literary history records the emergence of texts, authors, literary trends and movements sequentially and unproblematically. But literary culture, by contrast, refers to a complex network that includes the sensibilities or mentalities constructed around a common core of tastes, methods of textual production, paratextual activities like performance, recitation, or other use in religious non-literary contexts, reception and the social composition of audiences. So that uh, gives us a more complex idea about the way literature is situated in a cultural uh, network. Now, he, this Shudipto then writes about Bangla literary culture. This is the only essay in that anthology on Bangla literary culture. And uh, he follows uh, Shukumar Shen in uh, identifying the pre choitonno period and then the post choitonno with the Mongol Kabbo, the Bushnok lyrics, et cetera. And then the uh, sort of 18th century, which saw the emergence of poets like Bharat Chandra. And following that, uh, the most important part has to do with the um, rise of modern Bangla, which is uh, after the British conquest. Now, Kobiraj identifies a principle of inclusion and exclusion that bedevils Bengali literary culture. And this I find very important. Muslims are excluded or relegated to a separate alien category, Musulmani Bangla, or dismissed as sub-literary, not of sufficient literary merit to uh, be included. And he points this out, but does not try to redress this situation. He concludes that modern Bangla literary culture is a Hindu affair. So this is the view of Bangla literary culture from within the Kal Kolkata establishment. In the light of these observations, now where do we place Bangladesh literary culture? When did it emerge? How did it emerge? <clears throat> if we go back to the origins of modern Bangla literary culture in Kolkata, we realize that the we realize the pivotal significance of the Hindu college which is the first modern Western uh, institution for Indians. It gave birth to young Bengal and the so-called Bengal Renaissance. Has Dhaka University played a comparable role in the birth of Bangladeshi literary culture? Now, we can divide the history of Dhaka University into three phases, colonial, post-partition and post-liberation. In colonial Dhaka, the university, as far as Bangla literary culture was concerned, might have seemed to be an outpost of Kolkata, something in the backward waters of East Bengal. But it was, uh, well, that is true to a large extent, and yet there are differences which need to be pointed out. Because it was already set upon a different trajectory. The Buddhir Mukti Andalun, or freedom of intellect movement, was centered on Dhaka University. It had uh, Kazi Nazrul Islam as one of its chief mentors. And it brought together Muslim intellectuals and writers who advocated an enlightened, rational approach to social and cultural matters and opposed religious obscurantism of all sorts. Its inception is marked by the proposal made in 1926 by. Professor Abul Hussain of the Economics Department of Dhaka University, 
to found the Muslim Shahito Shamaj, which was joined by Kazi Abdul Wadud, Muhammad Shahidullah, Kazi Mokaran Sen, Abdul Kadir, Abu Fazal, all of whom have, are now recognized as literary luminaries in our history. Now, on, at the same time, Buddha Boshu began his literary career in the twin role of writer editor while studying at Dhaka University. He brought out the monthly Prabhuti, which published a large number of writers who have become you know, icons in our literary history. Buddhadev himself, Kazi Nazrul Islam, Jasimuddin, Gibbonan Rudash, Vishnu Dev, Mohitlal Mojumdar, and many others. Kazi Nazrul Islam's visits to Dhaka um, involved Dhaka University in a big way. He loved to visit Dhaka University. He stayed with uh, Kazi Mubahar. He met the young Buddha de Bush. Uh, Jasimuddin was on the faculty of Dhaka University from 1938 to 1943. And he occupies a unique niche because there's no one else like him. I mean, he's uh, um, Uh, sir, you have to, you have gone mute for some reason. Okay. Ah. Now, J Jasimuddin uh, occupies a unique niche in our literature. He was swimming against the tide because the, the tide was the tide of modernism. And he remained committed to the pastoral mode. And interestingly, he was not a naive poet at all. He was modern in the sense of being uh, self-conscious, a self-conscious artist. And in fact, he regarded the modernists like Buddha and others as artificial and imitative. And that they were following Western fashion and were not truly original. And he claimed that he was the truly original Bangla poet of his time. Um, so this was the kind of literary atmosphere in on the Dhaka University campus at that time. Very different from what you have in Presidency College or Calcutta University. With the partition of 1947, a number of writers and academics moved from Kolkata to Dhaka, revitalizing its literary scene. And we find useful insights into the situation just after partition in A.G. Stock's Memoirs of Dhaka University, 1947 to 51. Her beautiful prose captures the excitement of decolonization as well as the fresh anxieties and tensions that had already started brewing in the new country. We get a vivid impression of a new literary culture in the making, with Muni Choudhury, an avowed communist then, writing socially committed plays, Josimuddin taking Professor Stock to Mirpur, to a Milad, which turned out to be, a, to be quite unconventional, with religious songs followed by folk songs, including Josimuddin's own compositions, and then folk dances, and including a dance in honor of the goddess Kali. Now, the, this is what this talk mentions, and I find it really quite bizarre how it could fit into a uh, Milad, but I don't know if she uh, had confused it with another event, but anyway, the point is that it was a very unconventional Milad with songs and dances, and uh, also Jasimuddin was apprehensive that there would be some opposition from the Orthodox, uh, mullahs, but that did not happen, and they came back. Then, um, Ms. Stock also collaborated with a graduate of the English Department of Dhaka University in translating some poems by Muslim poets, including Kazi Nazrul Islam and older poets. So she translated a, an old ballad called Dewan Mudina. And then, uh, and also the work of the 17th century Muslim Vaishnava poets and uh, some putis. And some of them 
were published in New Values, which had been launched in 1949, I think, by Professor Kansar Ormoshi. Um, now, here we can see a clear difference between the Bengali literary culture seen from the perspective of Kolkata, based on a principle of exclusion, and Bangladeshi literary culture, which is based on the principle of inclusion. It makes room for the ethnic minorities and includes the whole of the literature in Bangla, including and also the wealth of writings by a host of Muslim writers about whom the Calcutta establishment is unaware. Uh, Syed Sultan, Paragal Khan, Kazi Dolat, Alaul, Hayat Mahmoud, um, you know, Dewan Kazi, etc. So there are literally scores of uh, poets who were just swept under the cup. Now, an explosive event in the development of our literary culture was the language movement, ending, which began in 1948 and ended in, with the bloodshed of Ekushe. Uh, now, let me point out the direct literary impact of the killings. Um, the first poems about Ekushe were written by Alauddin Al Azad, Sriti Stombo, and Mahmoud Alam Chaudhuri, titled uh, Katte Ashini. Uh, once again, Kaiser, uh, you have muted yourself okay. somehow. Okay. 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 Then in 1953, Hassan Hafizur Rahman edited an anthology of writings on Ekushi, which among the country's contributors were Samsur Rahman, Abu Zafar Ubaidullah, Fazlul Lohani, Abdul Ghani Hazari, there were stories, essays. Uh, then Abdul Gahar Chaudhuri's poem, Amar Bhaiya Dr. Angano, was set to music. And uh, then uh, there were more songs. And this became a this set, of, set, of, set of a new tradition uh, of uh, Ekushe writing. And there are anthologies, uh, interesting anthologies. Now, so the language movement inspired a new uh, a, a school of writers in this country. There's a new ge generation of writers who emerged. And the outcome actually was to give Bangladeshi literature a distinctive identity and how, where it differs from uh, the Kolkata writers. Um, there was a broad cultural renaissance with the Shongskriti Shongshot of Dhaka University playing an important role, introducing um, actors of both genders on stage for the first time. And, and in fact, I'm told before Kolkata did it, then the drama circle, and the, then at, soon after the Dhaka government art college was set up. Um, now, we need to, when we talk about Dhaka University and its role in the development of our literary culture, we need to um, extend what the definition of Dhaka University. We have to consider the extended family of the university. So it includes Buet, because it's Buet started as a college of the university, the Dhaka Medical College, uh, the Dhaka uh, Art College, which is now an institute of the university. And by extension, if you just cross the Sarwar Dhan, even the Shilpakala Academy, you know, then the Bangla Academy, which is housed within the campus. And I would say even the, the British Council is a part of the Dhaka University extended family. Because the British Council, that is, as it used to be, provided excellent services to the <clears throat> literary community, which was growing uh, in Dhaka. Uh, it has since mutated into a different kind of institution. But at one time, it had an excellent library. It um, showed like, wonderful films. Uh, it brought um, theater troops who performed here. Um, it brought um, visitors, literary visitors. So I remember Sir Samsul Haq, the late Sir Samsul Haq telling, telling us about uh, meeting Louis McNeese, who had been brought as a British Council visitor. And uh, Samsul Haq and one or two others of his uh, classmates were delegated 
to go and spend some time with Wim Ekmees. So all this, all this is part of the uh, Dhaka campus-centered uh, literary world. Now, then, the growth of modernist and open, later on postmodernist writing in Bangla. There too, the university has been in instrumental. Um, now, Buddha Bushu went from Dhaka University to Calcutta, became an influential uh, poet and editor and writer. His influence then came back here. And writers, poets from here, a number of them, also appeared in his magazine, Kobita. But Uttar Boshu and the modernists of Dhaka were two different uh, kettles of fish. Because, because of the language movement and the way the socio-economic and political realities of Dhaka and East Bengal were shaping up. You see, the modernists were always rooted in the socio-political realities of this country. And so, uh, if you just look at their uh, careers, you know, you find that there's always the presence of public themes, of protest, uh, which you do not find uh, in Buddha Bush, for example. Um, and a number of journals and movements, I think, deserve mention. Oh, like, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but you have three minutes. Okay. Yes. So it's, for example, Contashore, edited by Abdullah Musaid. Then the Sad Generation, uh, launched by students of Dhaka University. Then a Nagoshti, launched by some students uh, at Buet and also someone from Dhaka University, uh, uh, Nozul Islam of Geography. Okay. Um, with the political movements leading up to independence, poets and writers became engagé, committed, even if they were not members of any party. Uh, and the DU, Dhaka University campus, as a center of Adda, without which art and literature in this region cannot flourish needs to be mentioned. Not only Mothur, Mothur Canteen, but Sharif Mia's Canteen, for example. Mm -hmm. These played a key role in bringing writers together, in generating uh, literary discourse, arguments, debates. Um, then organizations like Lekhok Shibi, uh, I know that Asfar was closely associated with that. Lekhok Shibi used to hold its meetings on a traffic island on the Dhaka University campus. So the, um, it seems that no significant literary, artistic, or cultural movement uh, was without a vital link to that university. Um, the little magazines, um, of this, particularly of the 60s and 70s, you know, uh, many of them were produced by students at Dhaka University. Uh, let me, um, and some of them, uh, I think maybe one of them is still there. Uh, from our department, a young student called Naim brought out uh, Niram Thor, um, which uh, published some good work. Then another one of our colleagues, the late Khandakar Ashraf Hussain, used to bring out uh, Echo Bing Show, which in fact uh, generated a lot of enthusiasm among young writers and poets and who uh, sort of congregated around him published there and always got a feedback from uh, uh, Ashram Bhai. So we see that um, Dhaka University is in a sense this the, the sort of literary capital of this country. And uh, I, I don't know if it is still playing that role, but it ought to if it is, isn't. And what we need to do, I think, is not only to write uh, big histories about the country, you know, the so-called uh, grand narratives, we can leave that to politicians, 
what is necessary is the writing of micro narratives which will pay attention to little things because you see a little magazine published together can uh, you know through something like the butterfly effect that chaos theory uh, explains so beautifully you know lead to something really major uh, at some point in the future and you see what one thing that i would urge everyone to address one problem is the dearth of material about our literary culture researchers complain that you know they can't locate uh, magazines that they know have come out here from here so it's important to uh, you know have people who are, who are monitoring what is happening and writing micro narratives about all the cultural uh, events uh, publications the literary publications literary events and um, you know artistic events etc etc so uh, because um, once we have them and nowadays i think thanks to the internet it will be possible to uh, have the internet host a virtual library with with well, everything that a researcher could uh, uh, ask for so, uh, with that I, i think i've run out of my 20 minutes sadia yes sorry <laughs> I'll, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kaisa. Sorry for interrupting, sir. No, 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 no. Glad you have something that you were supposed to do anyway. So thanks, Kaisa, for first of all for keeping within twenty minutes, but secondly is giving such a spectacular um, uh, history of the uh, Dhaka University's involvement with culture, literature, and artistic production. Um, you mentioned a very important lack we have is in archives. um our materials are in short supply i don't know i mean he mentioned kaise mentioned the publication of ekushe uh, journals um uh, every year on the 21st uh, on the occasion of the 21st february students would bring out these magazines and they inspired all the students in taking up their positions as you know fighters of different kinds so that's one thing that we have but we unfortunately i like i look for the uh, collection of these akusha magazines but except for two or three we i i couldn't find any that's one lack we have i think um uh, imtias you can take a next project of building up an archive of cultural materials of dhaka university this can be electronically done and with the facebook and other um, facilities available you can disseminate the information all around the world and then you can have collections coming both um, uh, on the virtual world and also in a library a genuine library okay um so let's go to asfar hussain and he's uh, he will be speaking on dhaka university the culture of resistance colonial and post colonial conjunctures so asfar you have been always um uh, you have taken uh, quite a number of lenses all of them belonging to theory <laughs> so i'll probably you'll be probably looking at the history of dhaka university through a pair of lenses one colonial the other post colonial please go ahead and you have 20 minutes thank you sir thank you and uh, greetings uh, from this cold rainy west michigan and thanks everyone everyone in the in the audience for being with us and let me also thank the the conference organizing committee and imtias line for inviting me to speak today i feel honored and humbled that i'm here in the company have my own teachers professor sayed manzur islam and professor kaiser haq ones to whom i remain profoundly indebted for the ways in which they taught me and continue to teach me so the title of my talk as you have heard is is dhaka university and the culture of resistance the colonial and post colonial within quote marks post colonial conjunctures now my project involving as it does the conjunctural and constitutive symptomatic and organic aspects of dhaka university's institutional and counter institutional culture of resistance is a project that is not really in a state of being but still in a process of becoming indeed 
covering a period of 100 years of resistance at Dhaka University within only 20 minutes constitutes, constitutes a daunting, even an impossible task. But what I can possibly do is present only a tiny segment of my otherwise massive ongoing project, providing some high points in broad strokes with a particular, if not exclusive, focus on the early period of Dhaka University. I think I would do well to provide two quick notes on first, the very question of culture, and then second, on the genesis of Dhaka University itself, so as to be able to make sense of the culture of resistance that developed during, uh, at Dhaka University during different historical periods. As for the question of culture then, I range beyond its narrow conventional definition. Of course, culture encompasses, we know this, uh, discursive and signifying practices such as literature, music, the arts, and so on and so forth. But cult culture is much, much more than that. Let me invoke them. One of the most radical theorists of culture, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist philosopher and political activist, to suggest that culture embraces the totality of lived human practices. Banglai, ami bole thaki, ebang likheo thaki, eibhabe, je shanskrita ho, shanskriti hoche amader japito jiboner tabot onushiloner shabakro. As Anne Gramsci further suggests that culture is political and that it is possible to speak of the politics of culture and of the culture of politics as well. And I will be calling attention to certain aspects of resistance culture or the culture of resistance at Dhaka University, taking this term resistance culture from the Palestinian American critic, Edward Said's major work called Culture and Imperialism. Now let me return to Dhaka University, to its ge genesis, to put it briefly, even bluntly, out of a historically determinate, dialectically enacted intersection between the question of religion-based identity, Muslim, for instance, and the question of class, that is poor Muslim peasants in conflicts with Hindu zamindars, or the interplay between colonialism and communalism, broadly speaking, and more specifically, out of the political crisis created in 1911 by the undoing of the first 1905 partition of Bengal, there arose the idea of establishing a university in our part of colonial Bengal, in Dhaka. In other words, Dhaka University came into being on July 1st, formally on July 1st, 1921, as a decisively colonial project. Mark what Dhaka University's first chancellor, Lord Lytton, announced on February 22nd, 1923, at the university's first convocation. I quote, Dhaka University is Dhaka's greatest possession, unquote. Lytton added that the university served as a compensation. To use his specific words, I quote, a splendid imperial compensation, unquote, to the Muslims of East Bengal for the annulment of the partition of Bengal itself. Is then Dhaka University a benevolent, prosperous gift to the backward grumbling Calibans of East Bengal to deploy Shakespeare's famous characters from the Tempest as working metaphors here? Well, I think the answer cannot be just simply a yes or a no. In fact, the answer can be, realistically speaking, a nuanced one. And in order to provide probably one nuanced answer, I intend to take a detour by way of sharing with you my own Caliban poem called A Typical Haiku Dedicated to Caliban. Let me say a few words about Caliban here. In fact, Caliban is a character that appears in Shakespeare's play called The Tempest. So Caliban there is a slave and Prospero is his master and the relationship between Caliban and Prospero is this relationship between the colonizer, uh, colonized and the colonizer. And at one point in the play, in his mood and mode of resistance, Caliban says, I, uh, says, you, you, you taught me language, but my profit on it is I know how to curse. So now let me read my poem, a typical haiku dedicated to Caliban. It will take, I think, one minute and a half. One, Caliban, 
run, run. Run, 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 run. I know it's no fun. Number two, Caliban be in. Between being and seeming, Caliban is drinking. Number three, Caliban is speaking while pros Caliban is stinking while Prospero is speaking. And who says, come in? Four, a fleshy white guy. Caliban's dream and boredom he wants to buy. Five, you care, and you care, but I don't. Rain or sunshine, history, a snare. Six, layer upon layer, you make the same old damn point on my foot, on my hair. Seven, progress is history's dirty joke, or it's bad rhyme. Caliban fakes a sneeze. Eight, Caliban comes back, and boredom under the moon, someone talks of black. Nine, be quiet, Caliban. Don't dirty my Miranda. Caliban takes a U-turn. And 10, the night's dark, it's ink. Caliban pees on the brink. His pee stains stick and stink. Atypical haiku. So now in the light of my atypical haiku, I want to make a few points rather quickly and categorically and owing to time constraints, even telegraphically. First, the questions of progress and periodization. My haiku directly alludes to the great Caribbean poet Derek Walcott's line, progress is history's dirty joke. And in my abstract, I already named three periods vis-a-vis -vis the genesis, growth, and expansion of Dhaka University. The first period is called the colonial period, which is from 1921 to 1947. Kaiser also has spoken of these three periods. And the second one, is the neo-colonial period, which is from 1947 to 1971. I use the term neo-colonial here deliberately because we had been basically a new colony of Pakistan for quite some time. And the last period is called the post-colonial period, post-colonial within quote marks, or post-independence period, which is from 1971 to the present. Uh, to the present. Uh, Munzu Sir has already pointed out that, that, that colonialism is not really over. We have that legacy and there are different forms and forces of colonialism, sometimes not so visible. And I'm aware that any periodization tends to be amply vulnerable to deconstruction, but then it has been done for the sake of conceptual convenience. But I don't want to suggest that the story of Dhaka University is just a linearly progressivist one and that its history of resistance simply follows the Euclidean straight line there had been both progressive and retrograde movements over time. After all, life itself bursts the boundaries of formulae and formulations, of periods or demarcated temporal horizons. That being said, now I'll make my second point true. Dhaka University came into being as a colonial project, and yet it cannot simply be reduced to a colonial project only. Given that, Dhaka University was also an outcome of resistance. Of course, the immediate resistance to the undoing of the partition of Bengal, a point that I already made, but also different forms and forces of peasant resistances themselves, the history of which can be traced at least as far back as the initial enactment of the farmer and settlement project, something that doesn't get covered in standard historical narratives or accounts of Dhaka University, further Calibanizing, if you will, poor peasants themselves. Now my third point, one of the major contributions of Dhaka University during the colonial period in particular was the creation of the educated Muslim middle class in East Bengal, of course, at the expense of lower class people, particularly poor landless peasants. True, we tend to blink at the political economy of the production of the middle class itself. And then during the Pakistani neo-colonial period, Dhaka University surely played a decisive role in Bangladeshi national identity formation. Now the creation of a class and the formation of an identity have never been resistance neutral. I'm reminded of a slogan which was quite popular in the 1960s in certain parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And that slogan is, we resist, therefore we are. And what is resistance after all? but a way of being and a way of doing in the world, a ways that produce converging and conflicting constellations of forms, such as 
protest rallies, demonstrations, processions, riots, riot in the positive sense, rebellions, movements, uprisings, even armed struggles, and so on and so forth, and no less significant cultural productions themselves, including even what, what some political philosophers call thought praxis. True, within a few years of its inception, Dhaka University morphed into a vibrant site of intellectual exchange and thought praxis. And as Soya Dabul Buksud in his book called Dhaka Vishwavidyalai of Bangladeshi Uchushikha rightly points out, Dhaka University quickly became the intellectual center of East Bengal. In 1926, Rabindranath Thakur was accorded a grand reception at Dhaka University. Then in 1927, Kazi Nuzrul Islam was also given a grand reception by the Muslim Shahidu Shamaj of which Kaiser Sir already spoke. So the Muslim Shahidu Shamaj of Dhaka University, a particularly significant cultural intervention and thought praxis to which I will return later. But Nuzrul first visited Dhaka in 1926. In fact, on June 27, in 1926, Nuzrul delivered an insurrectionary blood boiling speech at the fourth session of the Muslim Shahidu Shamaj held at the Solimullah Muslim Hall, now Muslim Solimullah Hall of Dhaka University. And it was in that speech, Nuzrul said, and I quote in my English translation, without rebellion, without resistance, there is no emancipation, unquote. And at the end of his speech, Nuzrul read what might truly be called resistance poems, also anti-colonial and anti-feudal in character and content. Poems such as Tandari Hushiar, Amra Chhatradol, and Krishaner Gan, among others. Poems that inspired both students and teachers. Nuzrul again visited Dhaka in 1927 and 1928 at a time when he already identified himself as an anti-colonial revolutionary. And true, that revolutionary is buried at our own university, probably buried in more senses than one. Now, in the same year, in the same year, both Rovindra, now, uh, there's another year, anyway, um, that's 1936. In 1936, Sharad Chandra Chattopadhyay was also invited by Dhaka University. In the same year, both Rovindra and Sharad Chandra were awarded the honorary degree, DeLit, and no role of course, had to wait till 1974 to receive that degree. Now, I think I would do well to say a few words about the Muslim Shahidu Shamaj. Its journey began, as was pointed out by Kaiser Sir in 1926, under the leadership, under the leadership of none other than Dr. Muhammad Shahidullah, then a teacher in the Department of Bangla or Shastriti at Dhaka University. That society initiated that movement called Buddhir Mukti Andolan, or the freedom of thought or freedom of intellect movement, those who are associated with this movement significantly included such figures as Abul Hussein, Abdul Haq, Abdul Qadir, Kazi Abdul Odud, and Dr. Kazi Bakar said. And they used to bring out their annual journal called Shikha, while they also used to hold their annual conventions, their purpose being given their own account to liberate thought from the shackles and prejudices from the shackles of prejudices and superstitions and to advance the cause of backward Muslims in colonial Bengal. Although never did they advocate any communal position as such. In fact, in 1927, their first annual general session was attended by such Hindu figures as Sharad Chandra Chattopadhyay, Chadu Chandra Bandopadhyay, Mohitalal Majumdar, Dr. Ramesh Chandra Majumdar, among others. But, but no history of the culture of resistance at Dhaka University can be reckoned complete by any means without taking into account women's roles. And we must acknowledge that male domination flagrantly characterizes the production and reproduction of historical and other celebratory narratives of Dhaka University, as we see male domination in many other fields, of course. The first female student at Dhaka University was Lila Nath. She was also a student in our department, in the English department in 1921, and she was the first holder of the MA degree also. It is customary to invoke her as a mere fact without accounting for her real significance. And her significance lies in, among other things, of course, resistance itself, resistance as a political and existential imperative. In fact, Lila Nag was more directly anti-colonial 
than many of her male progressive counterparts at Dhaka University, as particularly, if not ex exclusively, exemplified in ways in which she led the movement for the abolition of the of the practice of taking a bow, you know, before the wife of Viceroy, you know, just to take one example. Leela Nag even believed in armed struggles and was associated with Netaji Shubhat Bushu himself and other revolutionaries. M. Abdul Rahim, in his book called The History of the University of Dhaka, puts it this way, and I quote, many students of the university, including women, joined the societies of Onil Roy. Onil Roy, by the way, was uh, Leela Nag's husband, and Leela Nag, under the social welfare services, they secretly conducted their program of revolutionary activities, unquote. It was Mr. not for nothing. We have three more minutes. So. Okay, I'm, I'm towards the end. It's not for nothing. It's not for nothing that she was the, and, and she was she was imprisoned. Our English department's product, Leela Nag, from 1931 to 1937. Indeed, she was the first female political prisoner in colonial Bengal. And then Leela Nag also founded and edited a women's magazine called Joyasri, while she founded and led the remarkable Deepali Shangha movement, which was self-consciously anti-colonial, as well as within court marks, feminist in its own right. Now, the first female teacher at Dhaka University was Koruna Gupta, Koruna Kora Gupta, an extraordinarily brilliant student. Koruna Kora Gupta taught in the history department and later became an expert on ancient India. She too was an anti-colonial activist, one was also arrested because of her organizational activities. Now, owing to time constraints, of course, I have to leave out a number of details and analysis and even make some leaps, conceptual and narrative both. In fact, I will again make some points quickly and categorically and then conclude. I think I have two minutes here. So while the colonial period at Dhaka University may be characterized by some ostensibly new thought experiments, organizational activism, and even some anti-colonial activism, cultural and political, pressed they are as they are into the service of the formation of the educated Muslim middle class in East Bengal, as well as by the building of what might be called the Pakistan movement leading to the partition of 1947, the post-1947 period, or what I have called the neo-colonial period marked the heyday or the height of Dhaka University's political and cultural activism involving both teachers and students. In fact, during this period, Dhaka University turned out to be the world's most politicized and politically engaged campus. Of course, it is customary, but it is true to say that the university played a pioneering role in a number of movements, particularly if not exclusively the language movement of 1952, which however did not start in 1952, nor did it end in 1952. The movement against communal rights in 1964 and 1966, the six point movement of 1966, the mass upsurge of 1969, and surely our national liberation movement of 1971. I should, however, emphasize that most of the progressive movements during this period were dominated by the left that played an invaluable role in forging a robust culture of resistance. Of course, we witnessed the rapid and tragic decline of the left after 1969. In any event, I will go to the extent of suggesting that the language movement won't have gathered its momentum and Bangabandhu won't have been Bangabandhu and probably even the birth of Bangladesh won't have been possible without Dhaka University, without its students in particular. And I feel so proud of being a product of this university, Dhaka University. But when I examine the post-independence conjuncture, I cannot but see different phenomenal forms of retrogression. I argue that such retrogressions have been made possible by several fundamental and interconnected configurations of our national politics, the bureaucratization of politics and the politicization of bureaucracy, the militarization of politics and the politicization of the military, the communalization of politics and the overall commercialization and even criminalization of politics. Our liberation movement of 1971 had three distinctly pronounced principles, equality, justice, and human dignity. Where are equality? Where? justice and human dignity in today's Bangladesh or even at our own university. Now, let me conclude by submitting that national liberation, democratization and decolonization profoundly interconnected as they are, are 
decisively unfinished projects and to carry on the legacy of Dhaka University's culture of resistance is to finish the unfinished and to create a future by changing the present. Reality is not a destiny, but a challenge. I stop here and thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Azhar. I'm sorry that you <laughs> were constrained by time and you could not speak elaborately on the third phase um, right. of Dhaka University, the post-colonial phase. You had to rush through some of the important points you made, but I'm sure when this article is published, the readers yeah. will have an extensive understanding of what you have in mind. All right. Um, you have very conveniently finished with the mention of Bongo Bondhu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, because this is what Anis will be speaking about, uh, the connection between Dhaka University and Bongo Bondhu, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and how he, um, I, I suppose, Anis, you changed your focus. You, you wanted to speak on the 7th March 1971 speech, initially wanted to make a linguistic study of the speech, but probably you have shifted a little bit from the that particular focus and so you will explain your own focus but let me tell you what he will be speaking on the uh, title of his um, uh, speech today would be uh, Bangamundu and Dhaka University from expulsion to expansion remember he was expelled from Dhaka University that's possibly he the historical fact that he is mentioning and then expansion both Dhaka University's activities and Bangamundu's activities as a student of Dhaka University as somebody who also fought for the fourth class employees. So please, Anis, you have 20 minutes. Thank you, sir. I'm very much delighted to uh, be in the company of uh, very scholarly persons and particularly uh, my thanks goes to Professor Imtiaz for including me in this session. And I'm grateful to Professor Sayyid Manzul Islam as well, who is my very direct teacher and in a way my mentor too. And, and uh, thanks to uh, Professor Kaiser Haq and also to Dr. Asfar Hassan. Yes, I did shift uh, the focus because the 7th March, it does come here, of course, in connection with that, but uh, uh, the focus is not typically only on the linguistic issue. And the title of the, my uh, paper, which uh, Professor Islam said, is Bangabundu in Dhaka University from Expulsion to Expansion. Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was perhaps an exceptional person who was unjustifiably expelled from Dhaka University in March 1949. And paradoxically, he remained an indispensable personality for students of the university who were his strength during all his following movements. Although the university formally withdrew his expulsion long after his death in 2010 in order to pay him due respect, from 1949 till his assassination in 1975, he was officially an expelled student of Dhaka University for demanding the rights of class four employees of the university. The political and very unjust expulsion that challenged his academic life turned out to be a blessing in disguise and his engagements with the students of Dhaka University and beyond increased many fold. Bangabundu, despite his official expulsion from the University of Dhaka, remained closely attached to the students of Dhaka University, inspired them immensely, and indeed got inspiration from them too. In 1969, the students' movement in general, by Dhaka University students in particular, bestowed upon him the Bangabundu title, meaning a friend of Bengal, to which I will come a little later. His close contact with students in particular and younger generation in general was a special phenomenon in his life which helped him shape his own thoughts. But long before this, he was always involved with the youth of Bengal since the days he was a student of the, the then Islamia College in Kolkata. His proactive roles, whether in assisting the poor and the downtrodden, during the great famine of Bengal or helping curb the communal riots in Kolkata have put him into the forefront of socio-political movements. He moved to Dhaka and admitted himself into the University of Dhaka with such humanistic thoughts in him 
which continued unhindered till his assassination. Ironically, on the same day, he was scheduled to visit Dhaka University as a chancellor of the university. Going back to his student days in Dhaka University, his first proactive role was noticed on March 11, 1948, when while protesting in favor of Bangla language, he was arrested. Although he, along with others, were released on March 15, during this brief period, there was some turmoil between the guard and the arrestees. Sheikh Mujib then took a leading role in resolving the issue and helped in the release of younger protesters. This was essentially Sheikh Mujib, a born leader who was prepared to share the burden of the society and bring forth a sense of relief to others. On March 16, again, just a day after his release, Bangabandhu joined the protesting students in favor of making Bangla as one of the national languages. In those days, it was called state language of the erstwhile Pakistan. On March 19, when Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the governor general of Pakistan came, in, came to Dhaka, both in Ramna Race Course and Dhaka University, he said, Urdu and Urdu alone shall be the state language of Pakistan, resulting first into vocal protest and then culminating into a wider political cultural movement all over Bangladesh. Sheikh Mujib, then a student of Dhaka University, took an active role in this episode of Bangla language movement. In the meantime, Sheikh Mujib, while still a Dhaka University student, also got involved into helping the landless farm laborers, known as Dawals, who were deprived of their share by the landowners, though they had to travel a very long distance to cut harvested crops for the landowners. These laborers were not allowed to take their fair share back home for their almost starving family. Mujib strongly protested against this injustice being done to the poor family. All these events, which we find described in the book, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the unfinished memoirs, uh, uh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, prove that Bongo Bundhu in his student days and more specifically uh, in his, uh, and more specifically during that brief time in Dhaka University, but not only active in political cultural act movements, but also in the fight for the right of the downtrodden people of this country. It is the same feeling for the underprivileged people that led Sheikh Mujib, the then student leader, to come forward to support the class four employees of the university who were deprived of the rights and privileges that they enjoyed before Pakistan came into being. Sheikh Mujib uh, not only was one of the leaders who along with his student party within East Pakistan Muslim Chhatra League came to support the class four employees, but also collected funds for them in order for them to continue their protest. And later on met the then vice chancellor, Professor Sayyid Mohsam Hussain, at least a couple of times requesting him to withdraw his order of firing these employees from their jobs. He agreed conditionally, I mean, the vice chancellor agreed conditionally, and later he refused to allow those who, for no, no fault of theirs, could not meet the condition. Following this, students' strike and protest under the leadership of Sheikh Mujib went on, and all meetings took place in uh, Salimullah Muslim Hall then. Uh, on March 26, 1949, the then Executive Council of Dhaka University expelled Bongo Bundu and four other students on charges of instigating a movement launched by class four employees demanding increase of salaries and allowances. The executive committee gave some conditions for withdrawing the expulsion order. These included paying a fine of rupees 15 each and submitting a guarantee of good conduct from the, their guardians in prescribed form to the respective provost on or before April 17, 1949. Most of them signed the bond and went back to the university, but Bangabundu and a handful of other students refused to sign the bond and were expelled. This also proves that he had the courage to sacrifice his personal interest and future career for his principle. Mujib showed similar courage and determination when he did not compromise his six points uh, program during his several meetings with Yahya Khan in March 1971. 
Hence, his brief life of approximately a year and a few months in Dhaka University ended apparently unceremoniously, but now looking at a hindsight of his checkered life of 55 years, we do realize the impact and the implications of those days of his in Dhaka University. Undoubtedly, they were too brief when measured in time, but they were very significant when reviewed in content. Sheikh Mujib was not, not an activist in an ordinary sense of the term. His actions and reactions were deep and everlasting. They continuously brought a lasting impact in his life as well as in our nations. In other words, he also put his footmarks on some very important elements of democratic movements, one of which was his never ending relation with common people. His protest against the injustices done to the class four employees of the then Dhaka University expanded into his movements for common people at the grassroots level and hence gradually his wider movements in later days became inclusive. The mass uprising of 1969, demanding autonomy for the then East Pakistan, combined with the demand for releasing Sheikh Mujibur Rahman from so-called Agatala conspiracy case, was one such example where the students once again made the movement inclusive and their source of inspiration was Sheikh Mujib himself. So it was a kind of two-way traffic that Mujib was connected with the student and the students were also connected with Mujib. Like in 1948, this time too, students formed Chhatro Shongram Purishad or Students Action Committee. But this time it was a very large committee and raised 11 points demand, which included a lot from six points program. And of course, the withdrawal of Agatala conspiracy case and release of Sheikh Mujib, who was the main accused in this case. The students movement turned into a mass movement and many other political leaders from progressive parties came forward to support it. Excuse me. The students movement began from the arts faculty on January 17, 1969. And during this movement, Assad, Mutur, Mughul, Rustam, and Surgeon Zahur Atonement and Rasha University Proctor Professor Shamsu Zaha were killed. Finally, the then government was forced to release Sheikh Mujib from cantonment on February 22, 1969. The binding with Dhaka University became stronger indeed, as Sheikh Mujib was conferred upon the title of Bongo Bundu by Tufal Ahmed the then Vice President of Dhaka University Students Union, Daksu. In a recent interview with Voice of America and with BSS2, Tufal Ahmed said, quote, I said we were conferring the Bongo Bundu title on the leader who spent his youth in a Pakistani jail and wanted to embrace death on the stage of the gallows with a smiling face. When Tufal talks about Bongo Bundu spending his youth in Pakistani jail, he essentially refers to the early days of Bongo Bundu in the then Pakistan, which I mentioned in this paper during his studentship at Dhaka University. I would say that even when he was no longer a student of Dhaka University, his relation with the university remained reciprocal. On the one hand, he always remained proximate to Dhaka University students. On the other hand, the students derived inspiration from him. That perhaps was one of the important reasons why Dhaka University remained at the forefront of all democratic movements, not only during the Pakistani regime, but also in post-independent Bangladesh. Bangabundu undoubtedly was a great orator, but his art of oratory developed gradually as he spoke more and heard more. As far as language is concerned, it seems he had a very good receptive skill and indeed his productive skill was even better. His association with Dhaka University and its students brought him in contact with a number of orators who he had the opportunity to listen to and adapt himself accordingly. Now, this is in no way to mean, uh, this is in no way is to mean or uh, undermine his talents, but it simply means his ceaseless interaction with Dhaka University enriched him as much as he enriched every generation of students from Dhaka University and elsewhere. The most remarkable example of his oration is his famous 7th March speech, which rightly made him the poet of politics. His speech on 7th March 1971 is a juxtaposition of several elements, both in what he said and what he did not. The pauses 
and silence in that speech surpasses the normal oratorial art. Text and discourse analysis, one of the modern ways of looking into language is essentially a language in use, which is not confined within alphabets, words, or sentences. On the contrary, it is through the intersentential as well as intrasentential relationship that we can explore into the meaning of the language, irrespective of the fact whether it is written or spoken. The spontaneity in his speech is worth mentioning, but unlike usual spontaneous speeches, his economy of words and the choices that he made in selecting his words cannot be overlooked. This is not to say that his speech was planned, although a draft of his speech was ready by noon on the 7th March, 1971. Bongo Bundu began addressing his audience as my brothers, but he inversed the sentence in Bengali, Bhai Rama. Uh, I know, I don't know how to translate it, mine brothers or something, but this expression is unique because it indicates his intimacy and proximity to the audience. One may however question the political correctness and find a gender bias in the way he addresses the brothers leaving aside the women who were present in that mammoth meeting. But we need to understand that the notion of this 21st century political correctness was almost unknown in early 1970s. It may also have lacked urban sophistication, but this had an element of sincerity and inclusiveness. Then he quickly moved on to briefly remind his audience of the situation under which he was giving his speech. Again, he included his audience with him when he said, you know and understand everything. Hence, Mujib took his audience into complete confidence without being seen as someone speaking from distance and imposing information from pulpit. He taking his audience along with him journeyed to the 23 years of troublesome history of deprivation and exploitation by then, by then Pakistani rulers and military junta. When he moved from the past to present and to future, his art of oratory needs a special attention because his sentences were remarkably short and there were noticeable pauses, which gave an ample opportunity to his audience to participate with him in silence because audience waited for the next sentence and he met the expectation of the audience. There are many such subtle and silent interactive examples which need to be discussed separately. I'm not moving into that. But at the end of his speech finally comes this sentence, the struggle this time is the struggle for our emancipation. The struggle this time is a struggle for independence. Bengali word mukti can either be translated as liberation or emancipation. Emancipation is a much watered down word than liberation. It could mean political, social, or economic emancipation. The word liberation too can be defined in a similar way, though liberation is much more a politicized word than eman emancipation. But his final stroke came when he used the word independence. Once again, he gave a pause between these two phrases, his listeners, like audience in a theater, waited eagerly to, wear, to hear what the leader was finally going to say. And the leader met the expectations when he said, the struggle this time is the struggle for independence. Notice that he said in the first phrase, struggle this time is for the struggle of our emancipation. In the second part, he doesn't say our, he said in independence. The audience burst into applause because this is the exact word they had been waiting to hear. Sheikh Mujib in a way has drawn an equation between emancipation and liberation on the one hand and independence on the other. The ambiguity is deliberate, if we know, so that the Pakistani military junta could not charge him immediately with sedition and attack unarmed Bengalis. I'm sorry, sir, you have three more minutes to, left. Yes, I'm about to finish. Uh, charge him immediately with sedition and attack unarmed Bengalis who have gathered to listen to their leader. Therefore, since the beginning of his days in Dhaka University, and in spite of his expulsion, Bangabundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman graduated himself as a great leader of the Bengalis who transformed a nation into a nation state. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Anis. Um, <clears throat> I was expecting you to <laughs> so, sort of finish your uh, 20 minutes quota. You have cut down, volunteered to speak two minutes less. Um, now the question and answer session, and I can see about 45 uh, um, participants in this session. Um, I don't know how many are there in the Facebook Live, if it is being 
show um, uh, uh, broadcast uh, in that particular medium. But I also do not know the modalities of asking questions and answering the questions. Maybe one way is, would be very simple. Just unmute your microphone and speak into the microphone and ask the question. Direct the question to the speaker and then uh, he will answer. Or you can write in the chat room the question, I can read this. Or the, part, uh, the speakers can read that and also answer the question. I, I don't know the modalities, so Sadia Pramoy, you have to help me there. Uh, how do you generate the questions? I know how the speakers will answer the questions, but how do you generate the questions? Um, Sir, I was searching for questions in the Facebook Live, but there are none. Um, most of the people, Congress related, everyone uh, for having such a great program. And uh, we are basically uh, waiting for someone to ask questions in the chat box or raise hands. Yes, I see that you have also sent a note uh, to every participant uh, how to ask question in the Zoom chat box. Uh, we have to really wait. But if you can start with uh, some of your observations about all three papers. Yes, um, yes, yeah. I, I, I have my observations, but um, I would have been very happy if uh, participants also let us know what they're thinking about these three presentations. Um, can I come in? Uh Sure, Imtiaz, you can break the ice. Yeah, I want to. Uh, let me break the ice. Uh, no, I enjoyed uh, all the papers. Uh, my, uh, it's a short question uh, to Asfar. Uh, just to get a sense, because you ended by saying that we still have unfinished project. I was wondering whether <clears throat> university can have any finished project, because university or any uh, ideas, you know, um, can there be a finished project? And I'm, I'm saying this, uh, you know, uh, because a lot of people would, would say that uh, uh, earlier Dhaka University uh, played a, a glorious role, uh, but they have somehow, you know, got distorted. Uh, and, and, and I have problem in, in, in this because, you know, as you know, I've stayed with Dhaka University all through uh, uh, because we don't look at other things somehow. Uh, we still, uh, you know, we, we have the utopia in our head, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but somehow I was just thinking whether any university uh, can have a finished uh, project. Uh, should we look into other things? And, and I go back to uh, Kaiser Bhai's point uh, of micro narratives, because this is somehow uh, it's not coming up because in, in, in Dhaka University, if you tell me, uh, still they're extraordinary, uh, you know, not all, of course, uh, which uh, none of the universities in the world would have that, but they're extraordinary, uh, you know, scholars uh, who are writing, uh, very creative writings. Uh, some of the plays that have come up after 71 are extraordinary. And I don't want to name some of the extraordinary plays that have come, uh, have been performed. Some of the, you know, uh, music that has come, some of the paintings, less, uh, even if you talk some of the painters that have come after 71, extraordinary painters, you know, uh, looking at them uh, and, and people get, uh, people will say, wow, uh, what a tradition of painting. So I was just wondering that should we start looking uh, into something else or, or, or should we follow the same uh, trajectory as far? Sir, can I interfere here for a moment? Because I was uh, going to uh, ask a question which resonates your thinking as well. Sure. So uh, I just wanted to share an observation that uh, as Sir said that we have had such a glorious past and uh, so many literary movements uh, was uh, hap happened in the Dhaka University. But now, uh, as far I have seen, uh, no literary society has been functioning actively which would make, make a different wave or make an impact right now. Now all of us are only going with the flow which in my thought are kind of tragic and as a member of the young generation I feel hopeless to see this new all-consuming BCS craze where our libraries are not being properly used for accumulating knowledge or uh, things like that. So sir my question is what can be done to make the flow turn in the other way around. Thank you. 
So as far as you have two questions and you have to answer, so unmute your microphone and your, your microphone has to be unmuted first. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Intias. I thought that I had one question. Now I, I have two questions. Okay. The question that Intias has asked has to do with finishing our project. Of course, we have to finish our session too. Now the thing is, as you know, that there is this idea, there is an entire theoretical intervention surrounding this idea of unfinalizability. You know, we are, we, are, we are always in a process of becoming, we are never in a state of being. I understand that one. But I was suggesting that we still have, there is still room for you know, interventions, room for improvement. We can continuously try, I mean, you know, efforts, we can make efforts continuously and, uh, uh, and just if you think that, well, this cannot be finished and therefore we should not do anything. That will be, I think, a kind of uh, defeatist uh, approach, uh, defeatist position to which I don't subscribe. That being said, I should also point this out very clearly that the kind of political culture that has evolved over 50 years, you know, has not really, um, I, as far as I'm concerned, given my own research and given my own analysis, uh, this political culture has not been able to even, uh, you know, enact those principles, the three distinctly pronounced principles of our liberation movement, principles provided by the army league itself, you know, they are at that point, you know, equality, justice, and human dignity. I, for one, think that uh, there, is, there is always, there's always this room for actions towards enacting, towards realizing these principles of liberation. That's what I was trying to suggest, actually. You know, I think that that's one question I thought I answered. And the what second, is the, can you help me get the second one? What is the second uh, question? What Sadia Prama is uh, talking about is the state of uh, passivity now in the intellectual climate of Dhaka University. And culturally, things have stopped. Uh, we are in a kind of a limbo. Uh, students are more, uh, there's a craze about taking BCS exam in the Dhaka University is used not for the same purpose it was meant originally. It is now a reading room for would-be BCS officers. Uh, that's the situation now. So how do you account for uh, the kind of degradation that you have been talking about? Yes, and if I sir, sir uh, wants to share some of his observations, that will be yeah. great too. So first, I guess, first, uh, let uh, Asfar answer this That's question. Fine, yeah. And then, because he has been talking about degradation, that ties with whatever he has in mind. Yes. And he can finish the last part of this one. And then, well, I'm speaking to Kaiser, because he will be in a position to throw in a, a stronger light on that issue. So, Asfar. As I already said, I, of course, I'm very proud, very proud of being a product of this university, of Dhaka University. But that doesn't mean that I will just uncritically uh, romanticize or idealize our own beloved, if you will, uh, institution. You know, degradation, sure. And how do you get out of this degradation? I think we need a strong political will. Yeah. Without that, I don't think uh, it's possible. Well, there are um, institutional efforts can go so far, you know, but uh, the kind, again, I will, I will call attention to the kind of political culture that has evolved and our national ruling classes, I'll put it this way, are extremely hugely responsible for this kind of, for the kind of degradation that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about and others are also talking about. So the national ruling classes need to be held oppositional. We should raise this question, what is the actual relationship between a university and the state itself. Mm -hmm. And what would be the role of the university? The idea of university is dying right now in some way. Or some people have, have gone to the extent of saying that it's dead. We have this uh, tremendous uh, commercialization of education. We have you know, this market-driven academic culture, all these things. So, and these things haven't suddenly fallen from the sky. It's, it's, it's this political culture that has tremendously adversely affected you know, Dhaka University's own culture. I'm a Dulio Coroner. Thank you. As far as Dulio Coron, Dulio Coron, to go to Beirut. Yeah, as far as point very well made. And now I would like to listen to what Kasser has to say about this. Okay. I think Sadia's question was specifically about literary and cultural activities and why there's a decline 
Now, well, just think of the history of this city. It has, when I was born in 1950, it had 300,000 people. Today, it has 170 million people. And as I was growing up, um, million. Well, you know, oh yeah, and then uh, when the uh, crackdown took place, there was 700,000 or 700, seven and a half lakhs. Dhaka in, um, in the city itself, yes. In the city itself, yeah. Now, I think uh, the um, dynamics of the city has changed. It's now, you see, when you had a thriving literary culture, there was a it was possible to create a distance from between oneself and the world, without which it is not possible to be creative. Creativity requires a certain distance so that you can sit back, contemplate, and then create. Now, the pressures of life have, have increased. The students come and the, the, with the, with the plan of preparing for the uh, civil service. And so from day one, alongside their classwork, they also prepare for the busiest exam. Now, as far as literary activity is concerned, where are the writers? Writers used to meet in tea shops, beauty boarding, Rex, mm -hmm. the Hotel Nile Valley, Sharif Mir Canteen. Exactly. New marketing issue restaurant gathered there. And that and also yeah. Hotel yeah. had a Now, the Adda, in Bengali culture, the Adda is an important institution. Mm -hmm. It has been uh, theorized by historians like Deepesh Chakraborty in provincializing Europe and the other writings. Now, <clears throat> the Adda has declined in Calcutta. Now, uh, Shudipto in that article, he mentions that when Adda began, literary addas began in Calcutta. They began as in the upper class drawing rooms. So And then gradually there was a democratization. And eventually you had students on College Street, coffee house, the famous coffee house. In Dhaka, a reverse trend took place. It began with Poets, you know, gathering in a uh, little sort of restaurant and you know, uh, doing the art. The places, yes. Uh, and then from the, in the late eighties, when I came back um, uh, after doing my PhD, and then after my uh, senior Fulbright, late eighties, uh, the late uh, Rafiq Azad, Rafiq Azad, did bole. Then bolan jaya hona apna art da den ko time. Bole je kisi art da jayega. Ami barite office ke kas kas kore, je barite bosun bosun kore, poshak poshak kore boshe taaki. Some well-off friend or acquaintance. They want a phone call. They ask you, "Amar bari the." So, the word would spread, and they would gather there, and they would sort of have food and drinks, and uh, to have an adda. So, it, it a reverse act of trend, mm -hmm. and the poets and writers also became, I think, in the process, alienated. From the uh, you know the new socio-economic realities of the city. Akon je Dhaka the socio-economic policy, and then after the garments boom, and you know, the, the, now we have a we have an expanding economy. Age nishta shadi kintu amader shahito jagoter shomprikto ta orokom nai. Yes, true. So uh, that just I think that. It, that has to be created. Uh, conditions which will allow the poets and writers to just you know, contemplate what is going on and produce you know, poetry, plays, uh, fiction, which uh, you know, uh, does, uh, it handles the, the new social, social, social phenomena in an adequate, adequate manner. Yes, Kassar, I think there is a, another reason for this shift. I think it's a visual turn our culture took, yeah. uh, which has given a different platform for self-expression. So people are visually active. If you look at um, the Facebook, it's a huge chat room in which people are showing and endlessly creatively also, to some extent, 
producing things that they cannot produce in real time, in real uh, structures like auditorium. TSC, for example, was a hub of intellectual activities. Everyone should mention the role of TSC in um, consolidating our culture. Like the new theater movement began from TSC. And also when uh, the poetry festival, the yearly poetry festival, which is about 30 years now, uh, began from uh, near TSC. It was something that spread the uh, print culture all around. And when poets spoke to each other, they did not have the facility of recording their conversations. So people had to listen. Now you can record things and listen at your leisure. You have mentioned the rise in socioeconomic activities. When economy is booming, everyone is working and leisure to that extent gets less and less. Leisure is something that drives creation. The rock art does in Calcutta. My friends in Calcutta tell us that this has disappeared because people don't have the leisure to sit down and invite neighbors into a rock adda. The same thing happened in addas. Everyone is rushed. A second thing, of course, is in uh, the 1960s, you had a political urgency, which was a kind of a backup for your intellectual activities. They were, they corresponded with each other. They supported each other. Now the political reality is so far away from the other realities of our life that they do not come in the service of literature and arts flourishing in a way that, that would build a culture. So politics is far apart from, let's say, culture. And there is always, as Aspar has suggested, there is a politics of culture and culture of politics. Both are missing in our country. As a result, people are on their own. We can't say the addas are not happening. Addas are happening in Facebook, participated by thousands. Um, and then you have addas in um, other, on other channels as well. So it's not that uh, everything has dried up. Um, let's take the social media. It is also a platform for hosting poets. You have a poet introducing his work or her work on social media and people, about 1,000 people would listen. Uh, you cannot expect 1,000 people to come and crowd in an auditorium. So in a sense, we have a bigger audience for things that you do on the social media platform. Maybe that's the trend of the future. And maybe someday when people would be tired of this visual media and would crave for the touch of printed books, maybe that culture would be revived, I don't know. But you are right. I mean, I think all combined, um, everything has created the kind of passivity that we imagine we have. But the, the writers and poets and others have not disappeared. Uh, you take, take from me. Boimela uh, Cholche, and you can, you, can, you can imagine how many new poets are coming and publishing every day. So it's not that everything is drying up, uh, Sadia. Your generation has taken a different route. That's it. So Sir, I have a Let me, can I just build on that? Yeah, because, yeah. Um, yeah. You see this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Mansoor has rightly pointed out the uh, emergence of a new forum, say, uh, a digital forum. Now, uh, the digital forum uh, enables uh, various kinds of uh, self-expression. So you have these YouTubers who are performing um, in various ways and even earning a decent amount in oh, yeah. Bangladesh. Okay? Then you have the uh, literature on online. Now the problem there is that these the online uh, productions have to be bite-sized. Okay? I think, you know, even when there's an intellectual discussion, I think the TED Talks have hit upon the right formula, 15 mm -hmm. minutes. Because if it becomes longer, people just lose interest. interest. The attention span, you know, is too short. So that is a limitation. And uh, the, with the new uh, sort of forum and uh, these digital uh, modes of expression, I think you also have uh, the phenomenon of transnationality because the internet can be accessed anywhere. And so there are people all over the world, the Bengalis anywhere can you know, access Not something really. that is put mm -hmm. online. 
And along with this uh, digital transnationality, there's also a growing um, physical transnationality because the urge to get out of the country, this is something that we don't normally talk about. But following just after independence, it really began. And since then, it has been growing. You know, I remember in the early 1970s, 1972 to 73, Hobbit, a friend from, uh, from Kupibak, so <clears throat> he took us to an evening adda in an under construction building where Azam Khan, who was then just a budding uh, artist, he performed, he sang some songs. And one of them was a pa parody. A parody of Ham Tum Ek Kamre Me Bandhu. <laughs> it went like this. Ami Tumi. Ami Tumi. Bangladesh Kamre Bandhu. Ami Tumi Bangladesh Thakbo na. Ami Tumi Cholo America Chole Jai Ar Bangladesh Thakbo. And within a few years, I found people I knew, including relatives, who had somehow, you know, got hold of, you know, they had, passports issued, and then they started channeling. So from here to Bulgaria, Bulgaria to Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, uh, yeah. Italy. And it's, a, hmm? it's a phenomenon, isn't it? Phenomenon. Uh, and, and it's, it's increasing. And you know, Amitav Ghosh's new novel, Gun Island, uh -huh. that shows yeah. very graphically True. how extensive this phenomenon is and how it is really sort of, it has, um, you know, grab the imagination of all the young people. Yeah, migration, migration has always been uh, a rejection of the colonial state, in a sense. So probably the new state, which did not deliver, uh, somebody mentioned utopia. Um, uh, Imtiaz has mentioned utopia. I think we all dreamt of a utopia at the end of 1971. You also have written recently on that. So probably because this was not being delivered, migration took place. So it's a rejection of the system entirely. So maybe there are different aspects of migration, but we have three more minutes in which you have to finish. Uh, sir, I have, a, sir, have, I have a, a very small question. Short and okay. simple. Sir, uh, yeah. I just wanted to know uh, both from Professor Kaiser Hack and from Asfar uh, about Rabindranath and Dhaka University. There is a section of people who do debate that Rabindranath oppose uh, the creation of Dhaka University, the establishment of Dhaka University. Is there any information about um, uh, Anis, there has been a session on uh, Professor Vishwajit Ghosh gave a, uh, his lecture on uh, this aspect. So I said okay. cliche thing. I, I don't think uh, we and should. Just, I'll be very quick. I My research doesn't show. I mean, Rabindranath never opposed the no, idea of you know, establishing a university in our part of the world. No, 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 not really. I, I, I didn't find any, I mean, anything. Uh, he can't. He wrote Eastern it's, University. It's true, though, some Hindu uh, leaders, middle class leaders, were opposed to the idea. That is true, but not Rabindranath Tagore. No, no by no means. Final word on that? I, I think there was a meeting in Calcutta. Uh, you know, a group of people even uh, lobbied the authorities. And they, I don't know, uh, they might have invited Rabindranath, but I don't think he went. He didn't turn up. He was invited. He was invited to everything, you know, but he didn't turn up. And I don't think somebody who has written the Eastern University will oppose a university. And if he That's did, right. he wouldn't come to, to Dhaka University in 1926. Exactly. Uh, just five years of opposing it. He was not uh, somebody who was that kind of a hypocrite. So uh, that question is raised by certain interested quarters. I don't know what their interest is, but obvious. They don't want the best for the Thai university. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, all of you. Um, sir, uh, Manzur, sir, there are two more questions in the chat box if you want to quickly address that. or um, Can you read that? I, I really can't see. Um, yes, sir, of course. Somebody uh, has asked the, the speakers to write memoirs. So, Kaiser, sir, that's a task for you and Asfar and, and then Anis. Uh, right before he also uh, asked do our speakers have in mind to write in comprehensive narrative forms their experience as scholars and the challenges they face from the state apparatus and mansura in the uh, uh, to professor kaiser hawk sir uh, thank you very much for discussing the concept of literary culture sir i was curious to know if one wished to navigate 
beyond Sheldon Pollock about the conceptual ideas of literary culture and maybe touch upon the subaltern in region, regions beyond South Asia and then what are the references that a novice could use? That's a good question, Kaiser, in one minute. <laughs> uh, yeah. Actually, I mean, uh, Sheldon Pollock's books are the only ones in which I have uh, come across uh, an attempt to theorize the concept. And I think one can um, build on whatever we find in his books. But it's a, it is a flexible concept. The whole mm -hmm. idea is that, you see, if you pick up a, a history of literature, you get a, a, a sort of an, an annal, you know, a, a sort of list of texts produced, so short biographies of authors, trends, movements, that's it. But the, the concept of literary culture uh, goes into the you know, problematics of uh, cultural production, uh, the uh, sort of uh, different um, aspects associated with literature, like performance, you know, publication, uh, in fact, anything that is related to the production of um, literature comes under the purview of literary culture. So um, I think um, it's, it's a useful concept and uh, I think it gives one more freedom to incorporate, incorporate, uh, you know, cultural uh, sort of analysis uh, while dealing with uh, writers and texts. Yes, yeah, so with focus on um, South Asia, uh, um, yeah. South Asia. That's it's a very sure. seminal book. But I'm sure um, there may be some other books we are not aware of uh, because mm -hmm. it's a growing. Yeah, I, yeah, it's quite likely. I mean. I'm a bit dated. I'm not I, yeah. a part of the beyond, South, beyond South Asia, given my interest in, you know, Asian literary studies, I can mention E. San Juan Jr.'s book on literary cultures. He does it in his book called Strategies and of Transgression. It is basically a book about, uh, you know, literary culture, you might say, mm -hmm. Philippine or others. So there is that thing. And the, some of the concepts are already taken up. I thought, I thought in the book called The Field of Cultural Product Production by Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu's book does actually uh, talk, uh, talk about you know, literary culture in some ways. But um, you know, Sheldon Pollock has fleshed it out in uh, different different ways. Yeah. All right, Imtiaz, I think we are at the end of the time that uh, was it for us, Sadia Prama. Can we conclude today's yes, session? Sir. Okay. We are almost at the end of day one, webinar three. Uh, I personally really enjoyed the energy the speakers brought to this session and how cohesive this particular session has been. For this, I heartily thank all three distinguished uh, speakers. And Manzarul Islam, sir, you did, a, you did such a wonderful job and conducted the session with such power and mastery. Uh, thank you all for your kind cooperation and your valuable time. Uh, I would just like to ask Professor Intiaz Ahmed, sir, if he wants to make a final uh, comment uh, declaring the end of the first day. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. We, we all enjoyed. Uh, just uh, uh, Anis Bhai's uh, question, uh, Professor Bishwajit uh, is speaking tomorrow on the topic uh, that uh, you raised. Uh, uh, Rabindranath, uh, exact title of uh, Rabindranath uh, Ebon Dhaka, uh, Dhaka Bishwajitala or Rabindranath Thakur. So he's going to speak tomorrow on, on this. So if you can join uh, uh, probably he will be able to give uh, details of the, the whole uh, debate uh, or or the pseudo debate as I as I always point out. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, thank you uh, all of you. Uh, uh, thank you, Manzur Bhai. Uh, uh, as always, uh, we have been in open getting Manzur Bhai. Believe it or not, I have to tell all of you, it, it's it's not easy. <laughs> it's, he, he's he's pressured, <laughs> and and he had an interesting term, and I thought, you know, Manzur Bhai should write a book on that. <laughs> Uh, but the, the way Jamar uh, or name, and I don't have time now. Time is not in our hand. Time is time is not in my hand. Our life is not in my hand, right? That was that's the title, true. and I said that should be the title of your next book. So, but uh, thank you, Mandu Bhai, for coming. Thank you, Kazar Bhai, as as usual. I we'll, uh, love to hear uh, you know more from you in the future. Uh, good to see uh, Anis Bhai as usual, and 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 we interact a lot over Voice of America. Although not on art, literature, and culture, but on serious uh, politics, 
and more seriously on 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 Donald Trump. Now, <laughs> but uh, final is is Aspar. You know, thank you very much, Aspar, for joining. I'm I would keenly look, uh, look forward to your uh, paper, and I'm sure uh, the rest of those of us would also love to uh, wait for all the papers because uh, I have to tell you the uh, Dhaka University is going to. Uh, publish all the papers in, in six volumes, and uh, my office will get back to you with a, with a timeline. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you can honor, if you honor the timeline, uh, we'd be very very happy. So thank you again. See you tomorrow. Uh, I understand at 6:30 p.m. Right, tomorrow at 6:30 p.m. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, Imtiaz, and special thanks to Sadia. Yeah, <laughs> Sadia deserves a high praise for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you